Unable to throw anything away, he became the UK's best-known hoarder. A Life of Grime special now on BBC One pays tribute to Edmund Trebus. I see trees of green. Trebus. It's a cool one. Magic Street Squad, stick it, it up your top. It doesn't matter. Please come down and speak to me. Think to myself. Look at that face of basketball. What a wonderful world. Two weeks ago, Edmund Trebus died at this residential home in North London. For a man famous for his David and Goliath battles with the local council, the end came peacefully, with his carer, Maria Doyle, by his side. He was just holding my hand, I was holding his hand, and I think we both knew deep down inside, and... He just shut his eyes, he went very, very peacefully. More like a smile on his face, more than anything else. What a wonderful world. Yes, I think to myself. He just seemed to that he'd had enough, you know? He just wanted to call it a day. The story of Edmund Trebus's epic battle against Haringey Council began here in the five-bedroomed villa that has been his home for nearly 40 years. I bought this house in 1964, brought up my family of five. Do you see that? Do you see that three? You see on those nylon ropes? They, they were enjoying that, you see, and even neighbors, uh, children, they were coming like, and so, you know, like children, you see, they like swings. Now, could you come in here? Now, yes, I opened, there was a door, but I done away when, when I moved in, years ago, and that's what's left. Over the last four years, the Polish war veteran has invited us into his life. His home was filled from floor to ceiling with his possessions. He had just ten square feet in which to live. Here's my bed on the right hand side over there. In this tribute, we'll remember Mr. Trebus's remarkable story in the program A Life of Grime. And bring the story up to date with films shot over the last year of his life. From the outset, Mr. Trebus's number one enemy was Mike Cording from Haringey Environmental Health, who'll never forget their first encounter. Apparently, he had become trapped in his house. Uh, I think for about two days, he was calling for help. A neighbour called the emergency services. They broke in. He had injured himself. Um, it was alleged he'd made tunnels through all the rubbish in his house and one, one day, uh, actually sort of climbing through a tunnel, all the rubbish had collapsed on him. I can't think why anyone would want to live in a condition like that. You know, choose to live in squalor, basically. Mike brought in contractors to price up the first clearance of the garden. He, he will not have it that it's rubbish. He, he will insist it, uh, it's all his own personal belongings. All right, obviously we respect his feelings, but it's prejudicial to health now with, with what he's doing in the garden, because he's using it as a toilet. Because he's got no facilities in the house. I see. If have you been inside the house? I've been inside the house. He lives in a very small corner of his scullery come kitchen. He, passages, staircases, he's all stacked up with dozens and dozens of black bags. If he'd cooperate mm. and help us sort through it, we could give him grant aid to provide a nice little ground floor flat mm. and stack whatever he wants to keep mm. upstairs. Doesn't want to know? No, he just keeps refusing us point blank. Now what right, in your opinion, has got the council 
to clear what they call all the rubbish, right? Old soldiers never die, that's what I learned in the, uh, during the war and so on. He was in Poland during the war, whether it's what, what the Germans did, because he's definitely got this thing, he wants to collect Grab things everything. around him and he's against authority. Well, the Germans took everything away and they were the authority at the time. Whether it's that, I don't know. In the 20 years she lived next door, Margaret Grand watched the collection swallow up every inch of his property. These were treasures for him. They were useful items, valuable bits and pieces that he would make use of one day. He would never understand that we just saw it as rubbish. He never understood why the, uh, you know, the council would, would talk about it in that way. Who gave you the right? It's my property, not yours. I know, Mr. Trabus. We, you know. Why we, don't you stick to it? We've got, Look, even the policeman has got to have a warrant from the High Court. He's got a warrant. So it's sent. You haven't got a warrant from the High Court, and don't tell me that. The police has got to ask my permission. You never bothered. You're simply dictating everything what, what you like. What's about the threat to clear my rabbi? Is it your rabbi? Simply against human rights, what you are doing, whatever you are doing. And that threat with, with clearing that stuff. You are lying from the beginning. Firstly, every day he would come up to me and he would try a different method of, of stopping us clearing. It could be an aggressive day, it can be a I will look at me, you know, I feel sorry for me day, um, you know, pleading, uh, so many different ways. It, it did tug on the heartstrings occasionally, because I did, yeah, I did feel sorry for him, although, although it was his fault he was living like that, um, all he kept saying to me was, please leave me alone and just let me live here like it. Leave Any me time. alone, please. Okay. I've got my right to... I agree, you to have you. got rights. To live. None of your business. Okay. And keep away and far away from me. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ah. <laughs> this ain't going to be easy money, is it? No. No, it's not at all. He can't understand why we're doing it, can well, he? he? wants to try and help him if you want. Yeah. Well, go we'll on Monday. Yeah. Edmund Trebus was born on Armistice Day in 1918. He grew up in a rural community in northern Poland, among a large extended family. Well, my grandma and grandpa, they were actually farmers. There was a, four sisters of my, you know, of that family, you see, which married different blokes, like, you see. One of them was a double four, where my father's brother and my mother's sister married that way you see of course they had fruit garden especially morello cherries and some pears and some apples and all kinds and so on mushrooms plenty of food and those blueberries you call them in english i reckon you know the smaller rather but rather tasty and i did enjoy it i must say that life. And my memories from that period are rather, you know, very pleasant like. When work on his property began, Mr. Trebus was not going to take it lying down. Look, take that off! Mr. Look. Trebus! Go, go to hell! Mr. Trebus, Look. there's a court warrant. Magistrate Scott, stick it, it up your chap. It doesn't matter who. Go away. Go away from my property. I'll have to You warrant. are trespassing. Get out of my property. I've got a magistrate's warrant there. If you don't let us carry on with our work, I'm going to have to. No, call I'm the not going to let you carry on. Can we carry on with our work, please? No. I can't. I'll find the place. As Mike called for reinforcements, Mr. Trebus took the law and the scaffolding into his own hands. Do 
if you do them up very tight. Until the police come, I can't do it. Oh, I'm sorry. Just come down and speak to me for a little bit, please. No. Please come down and speak to me. Who are you, you representing? I'm a police. I'm from the local police station. Local police. So I've come to, I've come to speak to you. He was never worried about dealing with people in authority, um, it, because I think he just always felt that that what he was doing was okay. He, he was right to be doing what he was doing. Because yeah, the act doesn't please. provide for taking him out without yeah, his permission, unless he's mental. Yeah, if they're mental, you can do But as I say, he's been psychiatrically assessed, and like they said we can't section him. You go and see a solicitor, and you go back to the court. But if they, if they want to execute this one... Eventually, Mr. Stopped, Trebus climbed down from the scaffolding, the court, but wouldn't actually, climb down over the clearance. After all, the council would charge him £30,000 for the job. Did you I think we've discussed enough. If the environmental health officer wants to actually execute the warrant and go in, Look. if you prevent him from doing so, you'll be arrested. Look, I don't I'd like to, to get those back on site okay. to erect right. the platform. No, they are not going to, to take the rubbish out. Stop doing Mr. that. Trevor. Stop oh, doing that. Okay, Mr. Trevor. Yeah. Go on then. I want to do it. Come on, sir. Look. Look. No, sir. No, come on. Look. Come on. Look. Come on. Mate, look. Come on. Mate, mate. Careful. Look, mate. The bus going on. Come on, sir. Look at us, mate. The bus going on. Look, don't you want to leave the bus going there? Get tobacco. Yeah. In a way, I felt a bit of a failure that I'd failed. I don't say failed in my duties, but I would have like to have been able to persuade him, you know, made him see reason that, that we've got to do it, but he, he was adamant we, we weren't going to do anything. Mr Trebus was charged with a breach of the peace and spent the night in the cells. Next morning, he returned to the battlefield. That's my property, those items, from the side gun. Can I just show you something, Mr. Schreiber? So what? How would you like to live next to a pile of rubbish that's stinking and infested with rats? So you could show they're dead, right? Well, that proves... No, it costs thousands of pounds. The Queen, our Queen here, to, to keep a squad killing rats at night time at the Buckingham Palace. And don't give me all that rubbish. <laughs> That's an old wiring loom out of a car, yeah, yeah, cloth yeah, braided. Yeah, it's totally yeah, rotten yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. useless. Look, but there, there are coils of cables of, and so on. I'm, I'm not only an electrician, I'm an electronics uh, engineer. I appreciate so that, I appreciate that. But we are only throwing away what stuff that is totally useless. Everything is rubbish. No, I'm, I'm saving this for you. This is your incinerator. I'm going to put it up the side. Look, you're pointing me out to one bit, but hundreds have been taken away. Well, bear in mind, Mr. Trevers, the vast majority of it is rubbish and oh no God. use to anyone. Well, yeah, only allowed to clear rubbish by that magistrate's court order, but not my belongings. Got a gun? I think I'll shoot this guy. I'm sorry that I'm still alive. It would have been less painful to have been falling somewhere on the frontier during the war in France or in Italy. That's all I can say. Mr. Trebus's refuge from the clear-up was the luncheon club he visited every day. He was here usually at 10 o'clock in the morning and I would have to chuck him out at four o'clock at night. I think Eddie was very frightened about the clearances. All the things that were in his house and in his garden, as far as he was concerned, was his. Nobody had any right to come and take them away. And it didn't help his health at all. I mean, that's the only time I've seen him close to tears. And he was very shaky and... He came here 
but he wouldn't stay. He had to go back to make sure that they hadn't done anything. And of course, while he was here, they were clearing. Rows with Mike Cording became a daily routine. You try to step over there. Mr. Trebus, you, re you, Mr. Trebus, you, re when we, hang on, hang on, please hang on. We, thank you. When we cleared that passageway, you've got easy access up it now. You, for some reason, you have refused to go up it. You still want to walk, climb over the fence. For goodness sake, you, Mr. Trebus. You are very me. Mr. Trebus, can I just show you something? You see all this chewed up paper here? Would you have any idea what caused that? You did cause it. Me? Oh, yeah. I often eat paper. You're making me work twice as hard. You know as well as I do, that's that the remains of a rat's nest. You know as well where, where you are wrong. Haven. Haven? Haven? 190 motorcycle in... Uh, Slightly poor condition. I'm very doubtful if it will start, but uh, obviously it's one of the things I'll save for Mr. Trebus. What he's going to do with it, I don't know, but uh, I suppose it's one of the interesting things we've found, apart from the rats and the nests, etc. One of the trees was condemned. It wasn't the only casualty. A very large lump of tree has just... Um, Demolished it. <laughs> Funny enough, it's not as bad as I thought it would be. I'm going to try and save what's left of it. Practically speaking, it's apart from scrap, it's useless, but it's one of the things he wants kept, so I'm going to keep it for him. So I'll try and put it out, out of the way. I'll turn it around the other way so he, he sees the good side of it. After six men had worked for 30 days, filling five lorries and 11 very large skips... Hang on, there's a rat behind you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry. ..the garden was finally cleared. I'm very bitter. Look, that's my garden. And I, I am the only person which has got the right to decide what to keep in my garden. The idyllic childhood of Edmund Trebus came to an abrupt end with the death of his father. Edmund was just three years old. I did remember even small details uh, from that time. How my father uh, was saving lives of those on a very large lake of fishers which have gone thrown out of the boats beginning of November. It was then snowing and he was in his office. He was a station master. He ran from the station. It was about 150 yards. Apparently, he, he, he did take uh, uh, his shoes only and nothing else, right? Jumped into the water and tried to pull them out and managed to save quite few of them. He died three days after, so I haven't got any more sort of recollections of that. Only when it comes suddenly somewhere in my dream and so on, those pictures I keep coming back, but then in the morning you are forgetting about. Two years after the first clear-up, Mr. Trebus's neighbourhood was on the way up. Crouch End boasted more than its fair share of cool cafes and fashionable boutiques. The property market was buoyant, but very little had changed in Mr. Trebus's plan. Another confrontation was brewing. Mr. Trebus was up to his old tricks again. It's amazing what one man can do in two years. 
another pair of trousers look they are surplus apparently but they are all new Marks and Spencer I mean they are not bad but what's his name that's all new do you see the short pants all new right it's a bit too colorful to me but well you never take them off uh, in the public so I'm not worrying about it well you are laughing look I I simply was crying in my life so I can cry any longer so I've got to turn it into a, into a, uh, into a joke of some sort a couple of weeks ago we we got a formal complaint about the rubbish um, it's building up to such an extent starting to smell etc so I suppose you could say basically we're back to square one again they all contain my my belongings right now what what business of council is that so Trebus could could look on it as being personal personal vendetta or something it's, it's nothing like that at all I try and make make it as easy as possible for Mr. Trebus, but he's uh, he's not the sort of gentleman that will take advice or, or help from anyone. Definitely no one from Harringay Council. And Mr. Cordy is still the big general of those big loots. What else can I say? Who is it? Oh. Hello, Mr. Travers. I see the gentleman which is the cause of all these troubles. It's about the rubbish again, Mr. Travers. Rubbish? Look, you've done enough damage. And you had enough loot to rob me of. Why do you want to clear? Why don't you go to hell? Right, Mr. Travers. Can I ask you one thing? What? I know you don't regard it as rubbish, but why do you want to collect all this stuff in your garden? I've got my rights. Yeah. Right. I fully support your rights, Mr. Trevers, but you cannot collect stuff like this. Yeah, who, t who told you that? Sorry? You can simply come here and, and giving me orders. I was in fighting for this country and, I know and, you were, and Mr. its Trevers. freedom, right? I... Have you been fighting for it? You wouldn't I'm even... not old enough, Mr. Trevers, but I would Look, if, if the call came. Even the Blooming Dad's army wouldn't let you be okay. their member. Anyway, Mr. Trevers, look... I... There are notices in there to do with the rubbish. Please show it to your solicitor and please ask your solicitor yes. to contact me. Thank yes, you. Yes, I will. Thanks, Mr. Trevor. Thank you. Here we are. Bye bye and for good. How's it been? Did you have your bath at all in the end? But the plot had thickened. Mr. Trebus had recruited an ally, retired businessman Bill Green. Do you happen to know? Uh, to know or to find out. Well, I can find somewhere not troubling you. I was walking through Crouch End, down by the clock tower one day. Edmund came walking down the hill towards the clock tower, and he was in terrible state. He was all bent over, he had two sticks, and he what didn't look at all good. And I felt very, you know, emotional about it. I thought, why is this happening to this man? And I just felt that if I got hold of his affairs and tried to get them going again, and to coordinate everything, it would help him. Rather like, you know, a sort of plate spinning act, really, where I sort of saw that all of Edmund's plates had sort of fallen off, and if I could pick them up and get him whizzing on one after the other, then he'd be on his way again, you know. I'm not still not receiving one penny. What are from the income the, support? From income support. Yeah, well, as much as I've done to try and get that sorted out, it seems that the DSS or the pensions department up in Newcastle haven't really done anything properly. And I thought that that was why the social worker had come along. Now, this is to do with it, because this again is a rehash, a uh, summons for the yeah. non-payment of uh, uh, council tax, but you do not owe it. I mean, I don't know what sort of dummies are running this country, to be honest. But niffy. Once again, Mr. Trebus was refusing to clear the garden. Mike asked one of the original clearance contractors busy, to quote for a repeat performance. You can quote for clearing the lot. No problem. And we'll sort it out when it comes to clearance. Nightmare. Oh. Well, I recognise the smell. Oh. 
Oh, so I might go for this again. I drew the short straw at yeah, again. Again, again That's yeah. That's my life story, that is. Nightmare. Another one, isn't it? Nightmare part two. Can't believe it, 82 and... I'll tell you what, he's a good worker. I hope I'm that energetic at 82. There's stuff in here. Biscuits in it. I don't know if that's fresh or what. It won't be fresh for long left out here. He hasn't carried out the clearance of the rubbish that we asked him to do, so we're basically telling him that because of that we're gonna take steps to clear it ourselves. Believe it. Where is it from? Haringey Council. Dear Mr. Trebus here, yeah. very dear to them. They'd rather see me dead by now. Private contractors will be approached to provide estimates for clearance of the rubbish on completion, all costs incurred together with the council's 30% establishment charge will be recovered from you. It does mean that they want another another load of loot, but that apparently wasn't enough. At Council HQ, the head of building control was about to open a whole new chapter in the saga. Bob McIver reckoned Mr. Trevis's house was falling down. Your friend of mine. Your friend of mine. These are the photographs, Mike. You can you can see that's the uh, front elevation. The arch has dropped considerably there. Uh, you can also see the cracks running vertically. That means that the join between the front and the flank walls there isn't one anymore. So the flank wall is now a freestanding wall as such. The main axis for this tree that's at the moment, because he's yeah. entering the property from the back, yeah. is down his alleyway. That's it, right under this wall. So obviously any brickwork or masonry falling out of there is a potential danger at any one time to him. Just one brick falling, if it hits him, they kill him. Our main concern is that this flank wall will move to such an extent that some or all of it will collapse. <coughs> Ideally, we need to take it down and rebuild it, but under danger structure legislation, we've just got to remove the danger. And I think it's time now where we have to say, yeah, it's potentially dangerous and you've got to do the works. Totally the inside of the house was now fuller than ever. In fact, no one knew whether the rubbish was causing the structural problems or was the only thing holding the house up. Inside the house I can only get here into this kitchen and climb over this heap and right in the opposite corner there, uh, there's a uh, a bed underneath, but I don't even know up to now whether my television is still there. With the prospect of legal action against Mr. Trebus, Bob McIver tried one last time to persuade him to mend his ways. Hi, Mr. Trebus. How are you? We thank you very much. I was hoping to see you until you point out exactly what the problems are. Have a, have a look from here. Do you reckon it's dangerous? That brick there is almost yeah. going to fall. Not going to fall. Look at, if look that, at if this the, wall. If that brick falls, Mr. Trevis, and you're there, that would kill you. You can see here that the whole flank wall is pulling away from the front wall. You can yeah. see the cracks going up. No, if you look down here, the inside. Yeah, but if, you have a look if at If you that. look down that wall, it yeah. comes out like that, Mr. Trevis. Yeah, but the photographs that I've got what, what show cracks what? that are 
between 100 and 150 mil wide. Where? You show me one? What that? Up the top. But you stopped me from repairing. I haven't it. stopped you from repairing. Yes, it. what have you done with that steel ladder? You Why can't did... repair this. You need to get a specialist builder. No, I've been doing that for years. What are you talking about? Oh God, I'm not going any longer to talk to you. Okay, You're talking true. nonsense. It's true. Where's the gate? You know the situation me? there. It's gone to a stage where next week it goes to court. I haven't got time simply to to go to your magistrate's court. They haven't got. Why didn't you go to the high court? <coughs> Why don't you go to them, to Mr. Okay, Blair? Mr. All right, Mr. Truce, we're on going. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. I'll see and you. And God forgive you for you don't know what you're doing. Okay, it's true. All right. The frightening thing is, he seriously believes he can do the repairs. I wouldn't like to be uh, see him get up a ladder. Um, maybe he can, maybe he can't, but I wouldn't like to see him. He's got a lot of, a lot of good points of view to put across. You do feel sorry for him, but uh, who knows? Maybe. Uh, Maybe in, in court next week, he'll turn around and say, I've got the loan, I'm going to do the works, this is my plan of action, and we can say, fine, great, do it. He, of course, believes that his home is his castle, and that he has rights to carry on the way he does, and collect all this rubbish and keep it, and keep the place in this dreadful state. I'm not for it, obviously. I mean, I'm trying to go along with the council all the time because I recognise that local laws and bylaws uh, mean that you can't just carry on like that. Mr. Trebus had a cunning plan. So there's the, the front entrance. His builders, Phil Hemmings and Frank O'Connor, were working on it. Um, that's a slightly uh, larger view. Yeah, well, this wall here is very bad, so we'd have to rebuild that wall yeah. and these trees would have to be cut back. Now, the ground floor flat, which is the best flat. That's, um, that's Mr. Trevis's Mr. flat. Trevis's. Then we've got the two-storey maisonette at the back, and then he'll have the large chunk in the back garden. The plan was to do the repairs, clear the rubbish, then convert the house into four flats. Mr. Trevis would keep one of them. The remaining three would be sold to pay for the work. We anticipate the, the overall building costs to be in the region of £250,000 and the revenue to be in the region of £350,000, so the profit is £100,000, which is split between Mr Trebus and ourselves. But while Mr Trebus was keen to have the repairs done, he had so far managed to avoid signing any kind of contract. Surprisingly, his builders took the risk and funded the repairs themselves, with no guarantee of payment. Not surprisingly, with the builders about to get the council off his back, Edmund was in high spirits. Boxes of broken biscuits all round. If you, I tell you, you, you are just in time. Here, that's for you, and you know what they are. Thank you. That's ever so kind of you. No, it's not kind of me. You don't believe me. Don't worry, look. Don't worry about it, look. But there's somebody else asking me for, for one and so on. There's another one, look. And, and for myself, I've, I've got always a... Uh, just a minute. And, I want you to believe it. What's that, young lady? It's another box, isn't it? <laughs> you make me feel so young You make me feel so spring has sprung And every time I see you grin I'm such a happy individual The moment that you speak I want to go play hide-and-seek I want to go and bounce the moon Just like a toy balloon One on three, thirteen. At the pensioners' luncheon club, Mr. Trebus and Mr. Green had cause for celebration. Seven and two, seventy-two. The builder 
now came for the first time and started uh, putting up scaffolding. It was my former builder and neighbor. And he was there and I really was, I couldn't dress myself quick enough for that. Eight and two. 82. They are repairing the roof, repairs, and everything inside and outside. I'm very pleased. 2-0, I've been waiting long enough, too long for my liking. Two weeks later, Bob McIver was impressed. From memory, we had uh, quite a big crack there. Yep. Um, is it around about here? Yep. Yeah, correct. Right. So we've uh, solved this problem here, and when we go down to the next level, you'll be able to see we've put some tyres in. Imagine the crack was here, in comes the stitch, and you lie it in there, you've, you've, you've taken all the dust out, and then basically you put in a soft mortar repair. Yeah. From the cancer point of view, the immediate danger has been removed. Um, so the idea of the cancer coming in at this stage and doing some immediate temporary works has been removed. Right, good. Um, but I think what we will have to be doing, because of the nature of property, we will have to continuously monitor, yes. as hopefully yourselves were. Whilst everyone else worked to secure his property, Mr. Trebus was giving it a wide berth. We've um, had to clear out all the rubbish around here so that we can get access to put the scaffolding up and get on with the repairs. Now, but, just we, when things we were going so well, Bill arrived to throw a spanner in the works. You've had a chance to look around to see whether, in fact, you need access to any of these areas. Do you know... Well, hang on a minute, can I interrupt, please, because I represent Ed and Trevers, and I suggest I'm considered, all right, I'm Bill Green. Hi, Bill. Who has author authorised you to do all this? Edmund doesn't want the place cleared of his so-called rubbish. Obviously, with the dangerous structures notice on the building... I'm not concerned but, about that. But, obviously, everybody's concerned about that, or else Haringey Council are going to take... As you know, we know that, but notice. the problem we've all got with Edmund, First, as you know, is quite frankly, it's very hard to get him to agree to anything. So yeah. I'm not against you and Frank. No, no it's right, fine. I'm pretty upset today, as you can see. I'm it's not, not against you with removing the rubbish, because I can see that you can't put up scaffolding That's right. uh, uh, safely while there's rubbish there. So that was quite a good idea, yeah. and we're going to overlook that. He will pay, no doubt, for the work you've done after removing the rubbish. He's not going to bloody well pay for you to remove the rubbish, all right? The, the Although the Mr Cordine would be glad that it's gone. The removal of the rubbish is not a problem. The next step from building control will be when the plans are submitted for the redevelopment of the, the house into whatever it's going to be redeveloped in, whether that's um, flats or whether that's just back as a one family house. Um, hopefully the next, next time we get involved will be to uh, approve the plans and inspect the works on site. So, with building control sorted, the full refurbishment could go ahead. All that was needed was Mr. Trebus's signature, but it wasn't forthcoming. Today's a good day to celebrate because you, 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 you've succeeded in getting off this issue regarding the dangerous structure. Oh, right. jump for joy. No, hang on, oh, no, no, let's, God, get, it, no, let's, let's get it right, shall we? Frank, I Frank told you Mo. already yeah. what I want. I want that roof repaired. Hopefully Mr. Trebus will agree that uh, what we're proposing is the right way forward. I still can't receive my letters. I still haven't got water. Well, Frank is... I still haven't I'll got gas. Quite Hopefully, four very nice units with Mr. Trebus on the ground floor with a, a, a part of a garden and uh, three units for sale. So it'll be sorted. That's still a promise to me. No, it's no. not a fact. No, no, yes. I put up with him and put up with him. We used to come down here day after day to this place and put it to him what it's really about, to try and get it through into his mind, you see. You know, what? I mean, why do we insist always that you are always right? No, no, it's, it's, it's been very frustrating, all right? But when I took this on, I felt that, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm very emotional. When I took on helping him, I realised I'd have to put up with anything he threw at me, and I'm not the sort to have patients, believe me. You know, I don't suffer fools gladly. Next day, no, Mr. Trebus had dug in his heels. He wasn't going to sign anything. But I will always object to it. I don't want any leases and any 
sellings. And well, we're so not, we're not I, about look, my children today, are not for sale and my house isn't for sale. No, no, it's not going to be. You will retain the freehold ownership yeah, of the property. I know, for, 90, for 99 years. Yeah, okay. that's the way it works, no, you see. No, no, it, 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 it shouldn't work like that. No, no, the no, no. You've got to understand one thing. Nothing can be done without borrowing some money from somewhere to do the work, okay? I mean, that's the di difficulty. Look, yeah. and I couldn't care less. Yeah. I'm not going for any leases. Edmund, being him, stuck in his ways, Why? didn't want to sell anything off to pay for the project. The crux of all this is quite simply that unless he signs up to the agreement for the project to go ahead, it doesn't move any further. Edmund's coming back tonight to sit in this rubbish again, and he will go on until it starts cracking and falling down again. But the biggest enemy, as I've said before, is him himself getting in to recognize and agree. I'm lighting at least six candles, you see. I haven't got any gas. They turned it off, you see. I'm sorry for myself that I'm still alive. I, I always say, if my creator, my God, wanted it, all right with me. If he doesn't want it, he'll change it. And that's my approach, that's all I can say. Mr. Trebus was 20 years old when the Nazis invaded Poland in 1939. The Second World War was to have the greatest impact on his life. I remember when the Germans were attacking and so on, and Polish were trying to withstand that attack, but had to withdraw, for they were overcome by, for Germans were using those Stukas, they are, uh, uh, what's the same, aircraft, which actually were diving right onto the sea. He lived most of the war under German occupation. You were not allowed to speak Polish to start with. There were notices uh, uh, pinned up on, on every possible place. And came to old people which didn't stand, you know, or didn't raise their hands, you know, uh, the high little way, you see, and so on. And, and, and hitting them in the face and so on. And if you remember that, you sort of feel a kind of that feeling of hatred, you see, those people. Are they mad or what? I mean, that's not humane and all the rest of it. That wasn't a very nice experience, you see. So, one way or the other, I did survive it. With the refurbishment cancelled, Mike and his men moved in to clear the garden a second time. I'm afraid to say I can't go along with you anymore regarding it either. I'll help you with other things, but I have to say that these people must get on with the work and clear, clear it away. Please leave my garden! Come on, Mr. Travers. Oh, Don't touch him, please. Leave my garden here. I, you've got no permission to be here. Leave my garden, please. You've got no permission of mine. I've got every right to defend myself and to defend my property. I don't think we'll stop him. It, it seems to be his life. We'll clear the rubbish and he'll carry on collecting and uh, if I'm still around I'll probably be back here in a year or two's time probably doing the same thing again. By this time Mr Trebus's debts were running out of control. 
The actual final cost of that big clearance two years ago came to just in excess of about 30 odd thousand pounds. I just do not know how he shifts all this stuff. This clearance at the moment, the figures that are in are in excess of eight thousand pounds plus interest for however many years it's on. Yeah, the night designer. Up to date, our costs have been around about thirteen thousand pounds. Then we'll have to get in the queue with everyone else and uh, put our charge on the property. Um, yeah, he's a wily old so and so. He knows or he knew what he was doing. I think I'm pretty sure of it. I don't think Mr. Chibbers would ever sign any paper. Um, that's one thing that struck me as, uh, as odd, that contractors would go in and start carrying out works without signing some form of contract. I, I don't know all the details of it, but that's what I heard, that he hadn't formally signed a contract, which, with someone like Mr. Chibbers, that's crazy. I am owing money. I am not owing a, 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 a soul on this earth. Not even a penny. If I was owing some money to somebody, I couldn't sleep. And so on. No, and believe me or not, I'm not owing one penny to anybody. After the war, Mr. Trebus came to London in the Polish resettlement program. And it was in this community that he met his wife. Very pretty girl she was, sort of. Dark hair, you see, and lovely uh, co sort of, you know, complexion. Anything what you could wish from your future wife, you see. What was her name? Josephine. Like, like Napoleon's favorite, uh, what's his name, lover. And how many children did you have together? Five. Were you proud of your children? Yes. Tell me some of the good times when, when you had your five children with you. You were living in London. Well, it's rather a very complicated business, you see. For with children is always, you know, he has got a problem, she has got a problem and all the rest of it. Oh, they... They sometimes had arguments with each other, so you had to step in. And, you know, the ordinary family life. I've seen many families and so on, and sort of a, had a general idea where to interfere and where just to cast your blind eye on it, <laughs> as they say. The family moved into the house in Crouch End in 1964. When we first came here, Mr. Trebus's wife lived with him next door, um, and I think his youngest daughter. But they left within four or five years because you couldn't, you can't live like that. I can understand completely why his wife uh, felt she couldn't stay. They used to have a small patch of grass where his wife used to sit on a deck chair in the sun and just surrounded by rubbish, that's quite funny. But obviously when she moved, um, the piece of grass went. I regretted that, that she came to such a, well, unreasonable uh, conclusion to, to this story. But, well, everybody has got his own will. We are all born free and we... We die free. <laughs> it was less than a year after his last visit. Here we go again. That Mike Cording found himself once again in Mr. Trebus's garden. Whatever you say, quote, quote for clearing the lot. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah, it's lovely. It's a nice one. Oh, dear. He's been dead a while as well. Now, Mr. Trevor says on, on many occasions he hasn't got rats. Well, it looks Keep like going. a rat to me. Good boy. I haven't really got the right shoes on for this. But this time there was no angry Mr. Trevor to start round three of the epic battle. This is the last chapter in Mr. Trevor's story. 
there's been a remarkable change to a remarkable man. Under the chin. Well done. He is a very handsome man underneath all that. You're very happy to have it off, weren't you? Trentfield Residential Home has a new guest. All right now. There you go. How's that feel? All right. Bloody awkward. <laughs> He was very poorly, he was undernourished, uh, he was very dirty. Uh, he just needed, I think he knew deep down inside he needed help and it was about time to accept it. There you go, sexy boy. Get in that bed then. If I'm sexy... You're... He just wasn't happy here at first because he liked his freedom. He liked to do his own little bit of shopping, his tobacco, his broken biscuits and bits and pieces. <laughs> Get in that bed, OK? Yeah. Swing those legs up. But I think when he realised that he was you know, warm and fed well and being looked after and cared for, I think he realised that this was the best place for him. Now you can see, gentlemen. Okay well, then, darling. I will count for time and countering. Okay. In this institution. Okay. Lovely. All right. But even at the home, old habits died hard. What he does is, uh, he will walk round the lounge and pick up every teaspoon possible. Mainly knives and forks. He, he settled for about five or six of those. <laughs> These are only a few today because we have been up earlier on. Like he'll come and take teaspoons, serviettes, <sighs> um, different lounge serviettes. And it's not very nice to do this, but we have to do it, you know? So. <laughs> I asked him many times why he collected stuff and he never really gave me a straight answer. It's a hobby like to him. I, sometimes I don't think he even realised he was doing it. Mr Trebus was in the home for nearly a year. <laughs> and he made the most of it. We get it almost every night When that moon gets big and bright as a supernatural Towards the end, he paid one final visit to his favourite luncheon club. OK. You look lovely. Get it. <laughs> We've missed you. I've had nobody to mow that. <laughs> <laughs> We have Mr. Trebus back, temporarily. Oh, yeah. Temporarily. Temporarily. Because you're being looked after like I told you you should be. Oh, he's a different man, isn't he? Looks years younger. <laughs> I haven't been here for quite a while. I was missing what your lost. You didn't recognise him with his beard off, you know, he's, he's been, never been. wash? And he's, he's, he's cleaned up. up. <laughs> he looks well. There you go, darling. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, yours? Lovely. Hello, dear. Hello, How are you getting going? Thank you very much. Oh, you back look again. very nice. Different person. Much. Pardon? You are a different person. Am I? Thank you very yeah. much for that. Where are your beard gone? Did you shave it? Yes, I have to. Good. Good. Much obliged, thank you. Are you happy now? Yes. I never had in my life as many, as many, what to say, marriage proposals. And you wouldn't believe it. It's nice to see him like as he is now. It's a vast change and he's a nice man really. They seem to have looked after you wonderfully. Oh God, there's so many other things to do. To watch every step of your life. When are you going to start writing your life story, Eddie? Never. Why not? Because I want to die before I... I How can you write that. it when you're dead, you silly old fool? Yeah, I know that.
I was absolutely amazed that he allowed anybody to help him. He must have been really ill and realised how ill he was. Did you let me slap you in? Oh, thank you. Sit, sit down there, darling. This lady's taking care of me. Come on, sweetie, don't cry. Sit down, sit down, let me slap you in. I don't want to lose you, do I? Look, if I, I think he was upset. When he left here, because this was part of his life for so long, and I think he appreciated that the chances of him coming back again were not very good. In the end, his old adversary came to bury the hatchet. Hello, Mr. Travis. How are you? Two and nine. You look well. I don't, I don't seem to recognise you. Mick Calding from Haringey Council. Oh God! Don't you recognise me? Um, not, not by your face, but no. and you know that I, I hated you most of all. I appreciate that, and to a point, and I can understand. Well, why? Yeah, I, I can understand why, but you you probably realised we had we had to take the action we, we've taken. Yes, I know. Well, I don't agree with that. When I saw him in the home, he had he had resigned himself to some sort of fact. I don't know what it, what what was going through his mind, but the fire had gone out of his eyes. He he looked like an old gentleman just sitting there. It was very sad, really. I felt I felt quite choked when I saw him there. Can I shake your hand, Mr. Trebus? Can I shake your hand? Good luck to you. You look after yourself. Thank you. And he even shook my hand as I left. There was a time if I'd have said that to me, they'd probably shook me by the throat. And Mr. Trebus will stick with me for a very long time. I don't. I have never come across a gentleman like him, and yeah, I'll never forget him. He was a nice old son, so really. Authority and Eddie never got on, and he'd fight them to the end, I think. I shouldn't say, but I think it was wonderful that he did. Put this in your lap, and not in your pocket. I don't know how I got so involved with one man. We have to be very professional in this job, but there was just something about Mr. Trebers that just clicked. I don't know what it was. I think it was his wit. His rudeness, um, the things he used to do, and I miss him terribly. Can you come, just come down and speak to me for a little bit, please? No. Go to hell. Want to see? and talk of your people. Look, that's my property. I know it's your The rats are here. It, you know, we, we are Look, getting lots of complaints. Rats are at the Buckingham Pirate Mr. Trebus, Tr 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 his bags and bags of you rotting rubbish. Okay, I'm hell. not getting involved with any arguments. Mr. Trebus! Have I done something wrong? I think to myself What a wonderful world. And a new series of Life of Grime begins next year here on BBC One. Ooh, yeah. Okay. You look lovely. Get it. <laughs> We've missed you. I've had nobody to moan at. <laughs> <laughs> we have Mr. Trebus back, temporarily. Oh, yeah. Temporarily. Temporarily. Because you're being looked after like I told you you should be. Oh, he's a different man, isn't he? Looks years younger. <laughs> well, I haven't been here for quite a while. I was missing what you lost. 
we didn't recognise him with his beard off. You know, he used to have a beard. And he's, a he's cleaned <laughs> up. He looks well. There you go, darling. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, yours? Lovely. Hello, dear. Hello, How are you getting on? Thank you very much. Oh, you Back look very again. nice. Different person. Much. Pardon? You are a different person. Am I? Thank you very yeah. much for that. Where are your beard gone? Did you shave it? Yes, I have to. Good. But, uh, Good. Much obliged. See. Thank you. Are you happy now? Yes. I never had in my life as many, as many, what is the name, marriage proposals. And you wouldn't believe it. It's nice to see him like as he is now. It's a vast change and he's a nice man really. They seem to have looked after you wonderfully. Oh God, there's so many other things to do. To watch every step of your life. When are you going to start writing your life story, Eddie? Never. Why not? Because I want to die before I... I How can you write that. it when you're dead, you silly old fool? Yeah, I know that. I was absolutely amazed that he allowed anybody to help him. He must have been really ill and realised how ill he was. All right, Eddie, let me slap you in. Oh, thank you. Sit, sit down there, darling. This lady is taking care of me. Come on, sweetie, don't cry. Sit down, sit down, let me slap you in. I don't want to lose you, do I? Look, if I, I think he was upset. upset when he left here because this was part of his life for so long and I think he appreciated that the chances of him coming back again were not very good. In the end, his old adversary came to bury the hatchet. Hello, Mr. Travis. How are you? Two and nine. Still alive. You look well. I don't, I don't seem to recognise you. One and three, thirteen. At the pensioners' luncheon club, Mr. Trebus and Mr. Green had cause for celebration. Seven and two, seventy-two. The builder now came for the first time and started putting up scaffolding. It was my former builder neighbor, and he was there, and I really was, I couldn't dress myself quick enough for that. Eight and two, eighty-two. They are repairing the roof, repairs, and everything inside and outside. I'm very pleased. Two, oh, blind twenty. I've been waiting long enough, too long for my liking. Two weeks later, Bob McIver was impressed. From memory, we had uh, quite a big crack there. Yeah. And is it around about here? Yeah. Yeah, correct. Right. So we've uh, solved this problem here, and when we go down to the next level, you'll be able to see we've put some tyres in. Imagine the crack was here, in comes the stitch, and you lie in there, you've, you've, you've taken all the dust out, and then basically you put in a soft mortar repair. Yeah. From the council point of view, the immediate danger has been removed. Um, so the idea of the council coming in at this stage and doing some immediate temporary works has been removed. Right, good. Um, but I think what we will have to be doing, because of the nature of property, we will have to continuously monitor, yes. as hopefully yourselves will. Whilst everyone else worked to secure his property, Mr. Trebus was giving it a wide berth. We've um, had to clear out all the rubbish around here so that we can get access to put the scaffolding up and get on with the repairs. Now, but just we, when things we were going so well, Bill arrived to throw a spanner in the works. You've had a chance to look around to see whether, in fact, you need access to any of these areas. Do you know? Well, hang on a minute. Can I interrupt, please? Because I represent Ed and Trevis, and I suggest I'm considered all right. I'm Bill Green. Hi, Bill. Who has author authorised you to do all this? Edmund doesn't want the place cleared of his so-called rubbish. Obviously, with the dangerous structures notice on the building. I'm not concerned but, about that. But obviously, everybody's concerned about that, or else Haringey Council are going to take 
as you know, we know that, but the problem we've all got with Edmund, First, as you know, is quite frankly, it's very hard to get him to agree to anything. So yeah. I'm not against you and Frank. No, no that's fine. Right. I'm pretty upset today, as you can see. I'm it's not no against problem. you with removing the rubbish, because I can see that you can't put up scaffolding that's right. uh, safely while there's rubbish there. So that was quite a good idea, yep. and we're going to overlook that. He will pay, no doubt, for the work you've done after removing the rubbish. You're not going to bloody well pay for you to remove the rubbish, all right? The room, the room, Although the... Mr Cordine be glad to put up with anything he threw at me. And I'm not the sort to have patience, believe me. You know, I don't suffer fools gladly. Next day, now, Mr Trebus had dug in his heels. Before. He wasn't going to sign anything. I will always object to it. I don't want any leases and any uh, sellings. And so, so not, I, look, my children today, are not for sale and my house isn't for sale. No, no, it's not going to be. You will retain the freehold ownership yeah, of the property. I know, for, 90, for 99 years. Yeah, okay. well, that's the way it works, no, you see. No, no, it, it, it's, it it's soon work like that. No, no, the no, no. you've got to understand I, one thing. Nothing can be done without borrowing some money from somewhere to do the work, OK? I mean, that's the difficulty. Look, yeah? and I couldn't care less. Yeah. I'm not going for any leases. Edmund, being him, stuck in his ways. Why? Didn't want to sell anything off to pay for the project. The crux of all this is quite simply that unless he signs up to the agreement for the project to go ahead, it doesn't move any further. Edmund's coming back tonight to sit in this rubbish again and he will go on until it starts cracking and falling down again. But the biggest enemy, as I've said before, is him himself getting in to recognise and agree. I'm lighting at least six candles, you see. I haven't got any gas. They turned it off, you see. I'm sorry for myself that I'm still alive. I, I always say, if my creator, my God, wanted it, all right with me. If he doesn't want it, he'll change it. And that's my approach, that's all I can say. Mr. Trebus was 20 years old when the Nazis invaded Poland in 1939. The Second World War was to have the greatest impact on his life. I remember when the Germans were attacking and so on, and Polish were trying to withstand that attack, but had to withdraw, for they were overcome by, for Germans were using those Stukas, they are, uh, uh, what's the same, aircraft, which actually were diving right onto the sea. He lived most of the war under German occupation. You were not allowed to speak Polish to start with. There were notices. It was a breach of the peace and spent the night in the cells. Next morning, he returned to the battlefield. That's my property, those items from the side gun. Can I just show you something, Mr. Schreiber? So what? How would you like to live next to a pile of rubbish that's stinking and infested with rats? So you could show they're dead, right? Well, that proves... No, it costs thousands of pounds. And the Queen, our Queen here, to, to keep a squad killing rats at night time at the Buckingham Palace. And don't give me all that rubbish. That's an old wiring loom out of a car, yeah, yeah, cloth braided. Yeah, yeah. It's totally yeah, rotten yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. useless. Look, but there are, there are coils of cables of, and so on. I'm, I'm not only an electrician, I'm electronic uh, I, engineer. I appreciate so. that, I appreciate that. But we are only throwing away what stuff that is totally useless. Everything is rubbish. No, I'm, I'm saving this for you. This is your incinerator. I'm going to put it up the side. Look, you're pointing me all to one bit, but hundreds have been taken away. Well, bear in mind, Mr. Trebus, the vast majority of it is rubbish and oh, no God. use to anyone. Well, you're done. Only allowed to clear rubbish. 
by that magistrate's court order, but not my belongings. Well, I can't. I think I shoot myself. I'm sorry that I'm still alive. It would have been less painful to have been falling somewhere on the frontier during the war in France or in Italy. That's all I can say. Mr. Trebus's refuge from the clear-up was the luncheon club he visited every day. He was here usually at 10 o'clock in the morning and I would have to chuck him out at 4 o'clock at night. I think Eddie was very frightened about the clearances. All the things that were in his house and in his garden, as far as he was concerned, was his. Nobody had any right to come and take them away. And it didn't help his health at all. I mean, that's the only time I've seen him close to tears. And he was very shaky and he came here, but he wouldn't stay. He had to go back to make sure that they hadn't done anything. And of course, while he was here, they were clearing. Rows with Mike Cording became a daily routine. As hopefully yourselves were. Whilst everyone else worked to secure his property, Mr. Trebus was giving it a wide berth. We've um, had to clear out all the rubbish around here so that we can get access to put the scaffolding up and get on with the repairs. Now, but just we, when things were going so well, Bill arrived to throw a spanner in the works. Give us a chance to look around to see whether, in fact, you need access to any of these areas. Do you know? Well, hang on a minute. Can I interrupt, please? Because I represent Ed and Trevers, and I suggest I'm considered all right. I'm Bill Green. Hi, Bill. Who has author authorised you to do all this? Edmund doesn't want the place cleared of his so-called rubbish. Obviously, with the dangerous structures notice on the building. I'm not concerned but, about that. But obviously, everybody's concerned about that, or else Haringey Council are going to take, as you know... We know that, but the notice. problem we've all got with Edmund, First, as you know, is quite frankly, it's very hard to get him to agree to anything. So yeah. I'm not against you and Frank, no, no, it's right. fine. I'm pretty upset today as you can see it. I'm it's not no against problem. you with removing the rubbish because I can see that you can't put up scaffolding That's right. uh, uh, safely while there's rubbish there. So that was quite a good idea yep. and we're going to overlook that. He will pay no doubt for the work you've done after removing the rubbish. He's not going to bloody well pay for you to remove the rubbish, all right? The, the Although Mr Cordine would be glad that it's gone. The removal of the rubbish is not a problem. The next step from building control will be when the plans are submitted for the redevelopment of the, the house into whatever it's going to be redeveloped in, whether that's um, flats or whether that's just back as a one family house. Um, hopefully the next, next time we get involved will be to uh, approve the plans and inspect the works on site. So, with building control sorted, the full refurbishment could go ahead. All that was needed was Mr Trebus's signature, but it wasn't forthcoming. Today's a good day to celebrate because you, 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 you've succeeded in getting off this issue regarding the dangerous structure. Oh, right. jump for joy. No, hang on. Oh, no, no, let's God, get it, no, let's, let's get it right, shall we? Frank, I Frank told to you know. already yeah. what I want. I want that roof repaired. Hopefully Mr Trevis will agree that uh, what we're proposing is the right way forward. I still can receive my letters. I still haven't got water. Well, Frank is... I still haven't I'll got gas. Quite Hopefully, four very nice units with Mr. Trebus on the ground floor with a, a, a part of a garden and uh, three units for sale. So it'll be sorted. That's still a promise to me. No, it's no. not a fact. No, no, yes. I put up with him and put up with him. He used to come down here day after day to this place and put it to him what it's really about to try and get it through into his mind, you see. You know, what? I mean, why do you insist always that you are always right? No, no, that it's, it's been very frustrating, all right? But when I can then climb over this heap and right in the opposite corner, there, uh, there's a, a, a bed underneath, but I don't even know up to now whether my television is still there. With the prospect of legal action against Mr. Trebus, Bob McIver tried one last time to persuade him to mend his ways. Hi, uh, Mr. Trebus. 
How are you? We thank you very much. No, I don't see you. So you point out exactly what the problems are. Have a, have a look from here. Do you reckon it's dangerous? That brick there is almost yeah. going to fall. Not going to fall. Look at, if look that, at if this it, wall. If that brick falls, Mr. Travis, and you're there, that would kill you. You can see here that the whole flank wall is pulling away from the front wall. You can yeah. see the cracks going up. No, if you look down it, yeah, but if you have a look if at If you that. look down that wall, it yeah. comes out like that, Mr. Travis. Yeah, but the photographs that I've got what, what show cut, cracks what? that are between 100 and 150 mil wide. Where? You show me one. What that? Up the top. But you stopped me from repairing. I haven't it. stopped you from repairing. Yes, it. what have you done with that steel ladder? You Why can't did... repair this. You need to get a specialist builder. No, I've been doing that for years. What are you talking about? Oh God, I'm not going any longer to talk to you. Okay, You're Mr. talking Travis. nonsense. Mr. Travis, Where's the gate? You know the promise? situation there. Uh, it's gone to a stage where next week it goes to court. I haven't got time simply to to go to your magistrate's court. They haven't got. Why didn't you go to the high court? <laughs> Why don't you go to them, to Mr. Okay, Blair? Mr. All right, Mr. Travis, we're on going. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. I'll see. And you. God forgive you for you don't know what you're doing. Okay, Mr. Travis. All right. The frightening thing is, he seriously believes he can do the repairs. I wouldn't like to be uh, see him get up a ladder. Um, maybe he can, maybe he can't, but I wouldn't like to see him. He's got a lot of, a lot of good points of view to put across. You do feel sorry for him, but uh, who knows? Maybe, uh, maybe in, in court next week he'll turn around and say, I've got the loan, I'm going to do the works, this is my plan of action, and we can say, fine, great, do it. He, of course, believes that his home is his castle and that he has rights to carry on the way he does and collect all this rubbish and keep it and keep the place in this dreadful state. I'm not for it, obviously. I mean, I'm trying to go along with the council all the time because I recognise that local laws and bylaws uh, mean that you can't just carry on like that. The frightening thing is he seriously believes he can do the repairs. I wouldn't like to be, uh, see him get up a ladder. Um, maybe he can, maybe he can't, but I wouldn't like to see him. He's got a lot, of, a lot of good points of view to put across. You do feel sorry for him, but uh, who knows? Maybe, uh, maybe in, in court next week he'll turn around and say, I've got the loan, I'm going to do the works, this is my plan of action, and we can say, fine, great, do it. He, of course, believes that his home is his castle and that he has rights to carry on the way he does and collect all this rubbish and keep it and keep the place in this dreadful state. I'm not for it, obviously. I mean, I'm trying to go along with the council all the time because I recognise that local laws and bylaws uh, mean that you can't just carry on like that. Mr. Trebus had a cunning plan. So there's the, the front entrance. His builders, Phil Hemmings and Frank O'Connor, were working on it. Um, that's a slightly... Uh, larger view. Yeah, well, this wall here is very bad, so we'd have to rebuild that wall, yeah. and these trees would have to be cut back. Now, the ground floor flat, which is the best flat, that's, um, from, that's Mr. Trevis's Mr. flat. Trevis's. Then we've got the two-story maisonette at the back, and then he'll have the large chunk in the back garden. The plan was to do the repairs, clear the rubbish, then convert the house into four flats. Mr. Trevis would keep one of them, the remaining three would be sold to pay for the work. We anticipate the, the overall building costs to be in the region of £250,000 and the revenue to be in the region of £350,000, so the profit is £100,000, which is split between Mr Trebus and ourselves. But while Mr Trebus was keen to have the repairs done, he had so far managed to avoid signing any kind of contract. Surprisingly, his builders took the risk and funded the repairs themselves, with no guarantee of payment. Not surprisingly, with the builders about to get the council off his back, Edmund was in high spirits. Boxes of broken biscuits all round. If you 
I tell you, you, you are just in time. Here, that's for you. And you know what they are. Thank you. That's ever so kind of you. <laughs> no, it's not kind of me. You don't believe me. Don't worry, look. Don't worry about it, look. But there's somebody else asking me for, for one and so on. There's another one, look. And I did remember even small details uh, from that time, how my father uh, was saving lives of those on a very large lake of fishers which have gone thrown out of their boats beginning of November. It was then snowing and he was in his office. He was the station master. He ran from the station. It was about 150 yards. Apparently, he, he, he did take uh, uh, shoes only and nothing else, right? Jumped into the water and tried to pull them out and managed to save quite few of them. He died three days after, so I haven't got any more sort of recollections of that. Only when it comes suddenly somewhere in my dream and so on, those pictures I keep coming back, but then in the morning you are forgetting about. Two years after the first clear-up, Mr. Trebus's neighbourhood was on the way up. Crouchend boasted more than its fair share of cool cafes and fashionable boutiques. The property market was buoyant, but very little had changed in Mr. Trebus's plan. Another confrontation was brewing. Mr. Trebus was up to his old tricks again. It's amazing what one man can do in two years. Another pair of trousers, look, they are surplus, apparently, but they are all new. Marx and Spencer, I mean, they are not bad, but what's his name? That's all new, do you see the short pants? All new, right? It's a bit too colorful to me, but, well, you never take them off uh, in the public, so I'm not worrying about it. Well, you are laughing, look. I... I simply was crying in my life. So, I can't cry any longer. So I've got to turn it into a, into a, uh, into a joke of some sort. A couple of weeks ago, we, we got a formal complaint about the rubbish. Um, it's building up to such an extent, starting to smell, etc. So... I suppose you could say basically we're back to square one again. They all contain my mix of those. These are only a few today because we have been up earlier on. Like you'll come and take teaspoons, serviettes, <sighs> different lounge serviettes. And it's not very nice to do this, but we have to do it, you know? So. I asked him many times why he collected stuff and he never really gave me a straight answer. It's a hobby like to him. I, sometimes I don't think he even realised he was doing it. Mr Trebus was in the home for nearly a year. <laughs> and he made the most of it. We get it almost every night <laughs> When that moon is big and bright as a supernatural wild delight Towards the end, he paid one final visit to his favourite luncheon club. OK. You look lovely. Get it. <laughs> We've missed you. I've had nobody to moan at. <laughs> <laughs> We have Mr. Trebus back, temporarily. Oh, yeah, it's 
temporarily. Temporarily, because you're being looked after, like I told you, you should be. Oh, he's a different man, isn't he? Looks years younger. <laughs> I haven't been here for quite a while. I was missing what your loss. You didn't recognise him with his beard off, you know, he used to have a beard. And he's, and he's, he's, he's clean cleaned up. up. <laughs> he looks well. There you go, darling. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, yours? Lovely. Hello, dear. Hello, Hello. How are you getting going? Thank you very much. Oh, you back look very again. nice. Thank Different person. Much. Pardon? You are a different person. Am I? Thank you very yeah. much for that. Where are your beard gone? Did you shave it? Yes, I have to. Good. But, uh, Good. Much obliged, so, thank you. Are you happy now? Yes. I never had in my life as many, as many, what to say, marriage proposals. And you wouldn't believe it. It's nice to see him like as he is now. It's a vast change and he's a nice man really. They seem to have looked after you wonderfully. Oh good, there's so many other things to do. To watch every step of your life. When are you going to start writing your life story, Eddie? Never. Why not? Bit off, won't you? Trentfield Residential Home has a new guest. All right now? There you go. How's that feel? All right? Bloody awkward. <laughs> what do you want me to do? He was very poorly, he was undernourished. Uh, he was very dirty. Uh, he just needed, I think he knew deep down inside he needed help. And it was about time to accept it. There you go, sexy boy. Get in that bed then. If I'm sexy... You're... He just wasn't happy here at first. Because he liked his freedom. He liked to do his own little bit of shopping, his tobacco, his broken biscuits and bits and pieces. <laughs> <laughs> Get in that bed, OK? Yeah. Swing those legs up. But I think when he realised that he was you know, warm and fed well and being looked after and cared for, I think he realised that this was the best place for him. Now you can see, gentlemen. Okay uh, then, darling. I was comfort I am encountering. Okay. In this institution. Okay. Lovely. All right. But even at the home, old habits die hard. What he does is, uh, he will walk round the lounge and pick up every teaspoon possible. Mainly knives and forks. He, he'll settle for about five or six of those. <laughs> These are only a few today because we have been up earlier on. Like he'll come and take teaspoons, serviettes, see, uh, different lounge serviettes. I, it's not very nice to do this, but we have to do it, you know? So. I asked him many times why he collected stuff and he never really gave me a straight answer. It's a hobby like to him. I, sometimes I don't think he even realised he was doing it. Mr Trebus was in the home for nearly a year. <laughs> and he made the most of it. We get it almost every night <laughs> When that moon gets big and bright as a supernatural wild night Towards the end, he paid one final visit to his favourite luncheon club. OK. You look lovely. Get it. <laughs> We've missed you. I've had nobody to mow that. <laughs> <laughs> Easy access up it now. You, for some reason, you've re refused to go up it. You still want to walk, climb over the fence. For goodness sake, Mr. Tree. You are. Hear me. Mr. Trebus, can I just show you something? You see all this chewed up paper here? Would you have any idea what caused that? You did, Scott. Me? Oh, yeah. I often eat paper. 
You make me work twice as hard. You know as well as I do, that's the remains of a rat's nest. You know as well where you are wrong. Haven. Haven? Haven? 190 motorcycle in uh, slightly poor condition. I'm very doubtful if it will start, but uh, obviously it's one of the things I'll say for Mr. Trevis. What he's going to do with it, I don't know, but uh, I suppose it's one of the interesting things we've found, apart from the rats and the nests, etc. One of the trees was condemned. It wasn't the only casualty. A very large lump of tree has just um, demolished it. Funny enough, it's not as bad as I thought it would be. I'm going to try and save what's left of it. Practically speaking, it's apart from scrap, it's useless, but it's one of the things he wants kept, so I'm going to keep it for him. But I'll try and put it out, out of the way. I turn it around the other way, so he, he sees the good side of it. After six men had worked for 30 days, filling five lorries and 11 very large skips... Hang on, there's a rat behind you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> ..the garden was finally cleared. I'm very bitter. Look, that's my garden. And I, I am the only person which has got the right to decide what to keep in my garden. The idyllic childhood of Edmund Trebus came to an abrupt end with the death of his father. Edmund was just three years old. I did remember even small details uh, from that time. How my father uh, was saving lives of those on a very large lake of fishers which have gone thrown out of their boats beginning of November. It was then snowing and he was in his office, he was the station master. Trebus' epic battle against Haringey Council began here in the five-bedroomed villa that has been his home for nearly 40 years. I bought this house in 1964, brought up my family of five, do you see that? Do you see that swing? You see on those nylon ropes? They, they were enjoying that, you see, and even neighbors, uh, children, they were coming like and so, you know, like children, you see, they like swings. Now, could you come in here? Now, yes, and open, there was a door, but I done away when, when I moved in years ago, and that's what's left. Over the last four years, the Polish war veteran has invited us into his life. His home was filled from floor to ceiling with his possessions. He had just ten square feet in which to live. Here's my bed on the right-hand side over there. In this tribute, we'll remember Mr. Trebus' remarkable story in the programme, A Life of Grime, and bring the story up to date with films shot over the last year of his life. From the outset, Mr. Trebus' number one enemy was Mike Cording from Haringey Environmental Health, who'll never forget their first encounter. Apparently, he had become trapped in his house uh, I think for about two days he was calling for help. A neighbour called the emergency services, they broke in, he had injured himself. Um, it was alleged he'd made tunnels through all the rubbish in his house and one, one day uh, actually sort of climbing through a tunnel, all the rubbish had collapsed on him. I can't think why anyone would want to live in a condition like that. You know, choose to live in squalor basically. Mike brought in contractors to price up the first clearance of the garden. 
He, he will not have it that it's rubbish. He, he will insist it, uh, it's all his own personal belongings. All right, obviously we respect his feelings, but it's prejudicial to health now with, with what he's doing in the garden, because he's using it as a toilet. Because he's got no facilities in the house. I see. If have you been inside the house? I've been inside the house. He lives in a very small corner of his scullery come kitchen. Passages, staircases, it's all stacked up with dozens and dozens of black bags. If he'd cooperate mm. and help us sort through it, we could give him grant aid to provide a nice little ground floor flat mm. and stack whatever he wants to keep mm. upstairs. Doesn't want to know? No, he just keeps refusing us point blank. No work to <coughs> Up to date, our costs have been around about £13,000. Then we'll have to get in the queue with everyone else and uh, put our charge on the property. Um, yeah, he's a wily old so-and-so. He knows, or he knew what he was doing, I think. I'm pretty sure of it. I don't think Mr Trevis would ever sign any paper. Um, that's one thing that struck me as, uh, as odd, that contractors would go in and start carrying out works without signing some form of contract. I, I don't know all the details of it, but that's what I heard, that he hadn't formally signed a contract, which, with someone like Mr Trevis, that's crazy. I am owing money. I am not owing a, 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 a soul on this earth, not even a penny. If I was owing some money to somebody, I couldn't sleep, and so on. No, and believe me or not, I am not owing one penny to anybody. After the war, Mr. Trebus came to London in the Polish resettlement programme and it was in this community that he met his wife. Very pretty girl, she was sort of. Dark hair, you see, and lovely, uh, sort of, you know, complexion. Anything what you could wish from your future wife, you see. What was her name? Josephine. Like, like Napoleon's favorite, uh, What's his name? Lover. And how many children did you have together? Five. Were you proud of your children? Yes. Tell me some of the good times when, when you had your five children with you. You were living in London. Well, it's rather a very complicated business, you see, for which children is always, you know, he has got a problem, she has got a problem, and all the rest of it. Oh, they they sometimes set arguments with each other, so you had to step in. And, you know, the ordinary family life. I've seen many families and so on, and sort of a, had a general idea where to interfere and where just to... Cast your blind eye on it, <laughs> as they say. The family moved into the house in Crouch End in 1964. When we first came here, Mr. Trebus's wife lived with him next door, um, and I think his youngest daughter. But they left within four or five years. 